Welcome to the Zen of Refereeing Roller Derby, Lesson 9, Inside Pack Referees. I'm Axis of Stiebel, the author of the Zen of Refereeing Training Manual. I'm filming this on May 23rd, 2018. The content of this presentation is up to date as of this recording. Should this video become obsolete or replaced by a newer version, I'll replace a link on the screen to where you can find more information. As always, you can find the latest version of my full training manual at www dot tinyearl dot com slash zenreffing. A quick disclaimer: the WFTDA, MRDA, and JRDA are not responsible for the content in the training manual or this presentation, nor do they make any claims as to the accuracy of its content. Lesson nine: IPRs, inside pack referees. Let's talk a little bit about the front and rear IPR duties. Front and rear IPRs, they both focus on the failure to reform penalties, failure to return, destruction penalties related to their side of the engagement zone. Basically, front and back, you got one at the front of the engagement zone, one near the back, and so they both kind of split the duties there, and as you're going to learn in a later lesson, failure to reform, failure to return, destruction penalties, all of these things are uh, various um, illegal positioning penalties that affect, uh, you know, that typically happen near the front or back of the engagement zone, although they can happen in the middle depending on the action. They focus on penalties committed by pack blockers, particularly against jammers. As we've said before, the bulk of the action in roller derby tends to happen right around the jammers. The jammer referees have, you know, are looking at the jammers, so they tend to focus on things that their jammers are actually doing that are illegal. So the IPRs, we focus on the other on the flip side. We focus on pack blockers and what they're doing again to each other or against the jammers. Now, we can call penalties on jammers as necessary, just as a jammer referee certainly can call a penalty on a pack blocker. So these are not exclusive duties, but this is just sort of where you want to put the primary uh, focus on what you're doing. Good form dictates uh, when you're working uh, or when you're uh, when you notice a call or, or when you, I'm sorry, when you notice a penalty committed by a jammer referee is give just a moment, just give a beat for the jammer referee to make the call first both because the jammer referee might do something you're not expecting. For example, uh, they might signal a no-earned pass. Maybe there was something that you missed you know, in the action. Or maybe the jammer referee might, uh, might call a penalty on the person, on someone else who committed a penalty on the jammer that made them then commit the illegal action. So, uh, which means the jammer did not actually, you know, does not warrant a penalty for their action. So, you know, it, it's good to give them just a beat to kind of get this. If you're going to call a penalty on a jammer, and mind you, there are many times that you will, be 100% certain when you make this call, as an incorrect call can have a major impact on the game. Again, if you call a penalty on a jammer, you are in a sense overriding the jammer referee's no call. So make sure you have a piece of information that makes you 100% certain that this occurred. If you're not 100% certain, don't make that call. IPRs, we also communicate the pack status, in and out of play status, and no earned pass information to the jammer referees. Let me elaborate on this a bit. The pack status is, is usually, uh, you know, signaled by simply, you know, pack is here. You know, we point at the, you know, point at the front and back of the pack. But that can also be, uh, as the group gets strung out, pack is front, pack is back, pack is all, is sometimes says pack is middle, I've seen before. There are, is a certain uh, advanced sort of um, communication. I'm not even all that skilled at it. There will people say, like, pack is three, pack is four. And, and they're identifying the number of people that are in a pack. Sometimes they take bridges into account. Sometimes they don't. This is not standardized. And I've listened to different people talk about it. And different IPRs mean different things when they say it. So things like that tend to work very well at your local area. Uh, maybe not as well. Um, if you're working with referees that you don't know, you know, if you're up at the champs level or something and you're working games there, then presumably they've worked out, they've worked out their system before the games begin. In and out of play status, you know, we've talked about this before. Out of play, you know, which you yell uh, to, you know, communicate to everybody else. And um, the front IPR also has a, a specific communication because the problem with, you know, if you've got a blocker who's stopping a jammer and they're getting you know towards the front of the engagement zone they're out of the pack but they're in the engagement zone and it's trying to slow them down to the at some point this blocker may go out of play so presumably the front ipr is going to be on this and the moment they get it uh, you know, they go out of play they're going to say out of play 
But the JAMA referee is not really watching the pack, and the JAMA referee is not taking that measurement into account very well, and the JAMA referee is relying on faith that the IPR has it. So if they don't, this is going to potentially have a major impact on that jammer. So one of the ways the the IPR compensates, the front IPR compensates, is by saying, you know, in, 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 or I've heard good, 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 and they just keep repeating this. Uh, I've also heard somebody say, like, you know, in the pack, in the pack, in the pack, in play, in play, in play, in play. You're, you're basically repeating the, you know, in or good or, or whatever the communication is over and over because it lets the jammer referee know that this person, you know, is legally blocking at this point. There, are, everybody's in good shape. Don't I, you know? I've got it. I'm on it. I will get the, you know, get that out of play. Uh, called out as soon as they go out of play. I'm on it. So sometimes you'll hear like, you know, in, 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 out of play, you know, and the ins are being communicated to the jammer referee. So in that particular case, the IPR is standing very near the jammer referee. Uh, but sometimes the skaters can hear the communication as well, and that is entirely up to them, uh, you know, if they want to act on it or if they wish to listen for it or not. There's nothing, we're not coaching when we say, you know, good, 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 or in, 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 in. We're not, we're not coaching, but they are free to act upon what we hear. What we're doing is just communicating with another referee. Now, once we say, out of play, we're absolutely at that point communicating it to the skaters on the track, because they have the right to know if they have reached the, you know, reached out of play. Similarly, suppose the, uh, you know, person yells out of play, but the jammer is kind of stumbling for a moment. They're not going very fast. Sometimes what happens is somebody in the pack is racing forward and suddenly they go back into play. So you might be like, out of play, in play. And notice the way, by, by the way, we didn't cover this in hand signals. Maybe I should have. When I, when I said in play and I went down, the problem with, you know, if you go like in play, if you lower your hand forward, it looks like, an out-of-play penalty, you know, uh, or what we're now calling illegal positioning. So uh, typically you, you bring your hand down as if you're going to, like, bring it down as if you're going to holster it. So uh, anyway, so, you know, just be a little careful you're not accidentally giving the wrong hand signal there. But my point is that um, you sometimes will have to say, you know, in play, you know, because you're alerting the jammer referee that the person has gotten back into play. This can happen a little bit at the front most likely happens at the back. You know, somebody's pulling the jammer back, you yell out of play, and so that skater darts forward, and then you're giving a very quick in play, and you pull your hand back down. Because you're letting the jammer referee know if this person engages the blocker now, it's legal, because they have gone back in play. Finally, no earned pass information. Uh, jammer referees are usually on top of this because you know we've talked about that if that person is uh, at the you know near the inside line, the jammer jammer referee tends to be looking down for that. So if certainly if you observe a no earn pass situation on the inside, and we'll talk about that more in another lesson, uh, absolutely, you want to communicate that. Also, you're looking to the outside sometimes, uh, or at least you'll notice from the outside, you'll see the referees out there communicating no earned pass and on occasion the gem referee can't see it just at their angle there's a tall blocker in the way they just cannot see that referee or maybe the referee's you know too far forward or backward and the gem referee's just not looking at the right right place so it never hurts to you know if you spot that no earned pass immediately also mirror it and communicate verbally no earned pass you know so that the gem referee can hear you and take that into account it is the jam referee's job to ultimately decide, you know, how the scoring and, uh, you know, how credit towards lead jammer is going to be done, but you are giving them a very, very useful piece of information. Finally, on duties, the, an IPR, usually the rear, but doesn't have to be, almost always serves as the game's he head referee. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of uh, weasel words in this, so let me explain. The head referee of a game may be any referee. It can be a jam referee, can be a pack referee, can be on the outside, can be on the inside. It doesn't matter. However, it is extremely unusual for a jammer referee or an outside pack referee to serve as the game's head referee. Just tradition, they're on the inside. In 350 games, I think I have seen maybe two or three where it was not an IPR who was, uh, you know, head referee. And there's often a very good reason for that. Uh, for example, um, I had a game when a skater was injured. Uh, the the one of the IPRs was injured, and we had to rotate everybody's position around. The, the injury occurred right right around halftime, 
and rather than uh, we, we shifted the head referee to a jammer referee position and and rather than promote a new head referee halfway through the game we elected to keep the same head referee but just simply have them head ref from the jammer referee position so but again it's very unusual now as far as IPRs go it's usually the rear that serves as the game has heads bleh, games head referee that's just the culture of officiating but it is certainly not required there are expert expert referees that strongly prefer f uh, head refing from the front that's entirely their prerogative. It's basically up to whoever's staffing the game to decide where, uh, you know, who's going to be head referee and where they're going to be working from. It's really not a problem. So it's more common from the rear, not required. Now let's talk a little bit about the rear IPR. The rear IPR holds primary responsibility for defining the pack. They're not the only one by any means that do this, but they do the bulk of this. They will be the one typically say, you know, pack is here, pack is front, pack is back, no pack, pack, you know, like that. They're the one that's doing the, the majority of this. The rear IPR is going to be looking in particular for back blocks and for failure to yield after a jammer line fault start. They are an ideal position to get this. Remember we talked a little bit about the OPR, where if, if the skater turns to face the inside, the OPR is going to have a better view of that person's back. Well, it's the exact opposite if the skater is facing towards the outside a bit. Then the IPR, in, in, you know, if they're near the back of the pack, the rear IPR is going to have an ideal view looking for this. Failure to yield after a jammer line fault start. We'll explain what this means in another lesson, but in a nutshell, we got the jammer line. They have to start in a legal starting position. If they don't start in an entirely legal starting position, or if they start in a partially legal starting position, it's, it's, there's an important distinction here, uh, then they have to yield their advantage. If they don't, they get a failure to yield penalty. Again, we'll talk about all this later, but suffice to say that the rear IPR has an ideal view looking for this. We talked a little bit, remember, uh, in the OPR lesson that OPRs want to be looking for that as well, because if they take care of this, it's that much off the, you know, the plate of the, of the rear IPR. And considering the rear IPR is also doing all the pack formation such at the same time, that's really handy when the OPRs snag that, so the rear IPR doesn't have to. But sometimes the rear IPR does. The rear IPR also watches blockers for legal pack reentry. For example, when someone's returning from the penalty box, they have to return behind all, uh, you know, all blockers in the engagement zone. So, but sometimes they don't, and they kind of come into the middle, and the rear IPR, you know, might catch that. Again, we suggested the OPRs watch for this because it's very handy if they get it instead of, you know, the, the rear IPR. This also includes returning to play, having temporarily removed uh, oneself to the game due to, say, equipment failure, very minor injury, something like that. The rear IPR is, uh, is also looking for penalties to, or I'm sorry, uh, looking for skaters that need to be sent back to the penalty box, meaning they're in the queue. Um, the we talked about the penalty box manager is holding the whiteboard above their head and they've got their little code on the, uh, the whiteboard. That's that's exactly what we're talking about. Again, if the OPRs can snag it, it makes it that much easier for the rear IPR. So if you're, you're, you're catching, there's a lot of overlap between the two. That's because, remember, we have three OPRs and one of them was in the rear. And that person is perfectly situated for doing a number of these tasks so that the rear IPR doesn't have to. And the rear IPR, if you just watch them for a game, they have their plate full of stuff. Uh, the pack formation alone is going to take a, a significant amount of brain power just to handle. Finally, between jams, confirm that skaters in the penalty box queue are entering the next jam in the correct position. Now, let me, let me throw a little situation at you. Suppose there's one skater left on the track, one blocker, and this blocker is, uh, commits a penalty. We can't send them off the track because we need to have at least one blocker from each team on the track or else we can't have a pack and the whole game breaks down. The other three blockers are still serving time in the penalty box. Jam ends. In the next jam, that person still owes us a penalty. They committed that penalty. They haven't served it yet. They can skate over to the box between jams and just let the box know that they're in the queue, which, uh, but then they have to get back on the track and be in the next jam so that they can go serve that penalty when space opens up in the box. However, we can't have them changing positions. We can't have them decide in the next jam, you know, oh, I want to be the pivot. Or worse yet, they were the pivot in the previous jam. The next jam, so I'm going to be a blocker. That way, when I serve a penalty, uh, we don't actually lose our, you know, lo lose uh, our pivot on the track during that time in case we want to do a star pass. Part of getting a penalty is it has to be served by the position as well as the skater. So 
the rear IPR, again, confirming that all the skaters that are in the penalty box queue are entering the next jam in the correct position. If we don't do that, we tend to have a cascading series of errors that really messes a lot of things up. And we've talked about that. We really like to avoid those because they're a real mess, mess to clean up. Now let's talk a little bit about the duties of the front IPR. The front IPR defines the pack when the rear IPR needs assistance. The rear IPR, like we said, has the, has the bulk of the defining the pack, but they're not always going to get it 100% right. Uh, for example, there may be an out of play situation in the rear, and now they're facing this way, and they're not, you know, they're not really looking at the uh, at the pack very well, um, or they may be issuing a penalty and they're in the middle of saying something. You know, they can get busy. Basically, they can also get confused, or sometimes they err. All of these three situations are times when the front IPR is going to step in and take the pack. Now, oftentimes we'll say, like, pack is back, pack is front. Well, pack is front is the way basically saying the pack is near the front and we've got skaters that are stringing out in back. Those skaters stringing out in back are going to take a lot of attention from the rear IPR. So when the rear IPR says pack is front, that's a way of say telling the front IPR, you're in charge. When the uh, when the pack is, you know, all everybody's kind of back together again, or if for some reason the pack shifts and it's now in back, that's when the front IPR or you know, whomever can say, you know, pack is back or pack is all. And that's a signal to the rear IPR, you're in charge again. Now again, if the rear IPR is in the middle of calling a penalty or is just getting confused, and believe me, if you've ever done pack formation, uh, when the skaters start going like this all over the place, it can get very easy to get confused on where the pack is. And they're falling down and they're going in and out of bounds and such. It's, it's happening so rapidly, it's difficult to keep up. So by all means, the front IPR can step in and help at any time when the rear IPR needs a bit more assistance. So, and the rear IPR will probably appreciate that. What you want to avoid is the front IPR like stepping on the toes of the rear IPR. So for example, we want to call that uh, no pack when, uh, you know, like the two groups of blockers are more than 10 feet apart, for example. And now we have no, no pack, you know, no single pack or, or just no pack at all. And 10 feet is the right way to do it. But if you're the front uh, IPR and you're going, oh my God, it's 10 foot one inch, uh, that's probably not quite the time to call it because the rear IPR you know, their angle's slightly different. They may be saying, okay, well, it looks like nine and a half feet. So, you know, I'm not quite going to call it, but if that person takes even another single step, then I'm going to. So, you know, you want to give the rear IPR a little bit of leeway. One of the things I like to do as front IPR when I'm working with a rear IPR that I've never worked with is I specifically take the first couple of jams and provide them less assistance than I might normally do. Because what I'm trying to do is see at what point they start running into trouble, when they get a little confused, uh, where how they're measuring their 10 feet from their angle. I mean, 10 feet in theory should be 10 feet. 10 feet is 10 feet is 10 feet. But it doesn't always work that way. Some referees are a little tighter, some are a little looser on it. And I really don't want to be spending the whole game arguing with the rear IPR about what constitute 10 feet. The skaters can adapt if a referee is going to be a little tighter or a little looser. But what they need is consistency among the referee crew. So I'm specifically going to wait a little bit on that because I want to see how that ref how the rear IPR, how, first off, how well they can manage pack formation, but second, how they're going to measure their 10 feet, or in the case of you know the out-of-plays, how they're going to measure their 20 feet. The front IPR watches closely for several penalties. They watch for multiplayer blocks. Multiplayer blocks not always, but they're very often visible from the front, but not very well from the back. So the front IPR is in an ideal position to look for those. The front IPR is also going to be looking for skaters that are using like their elbows or forearms to swim through the pack. You know, their jammers trying to get through their blockers in the way and they reach out and they kind of just push someone aside and then they manage to get forward through that. The jammer referee might be approximately even with them and might not be able to see the way the forearm is moving. But the front IPR, who's 10 feet, 15 feet ahead, looking back, uh, you know, looking back at the pack, might have a better view and might be able to see this happening. There are certainly other penalties to, to look for, but these are two that are particularly good for seeing from the front. The front IPR is also going to communicate lead is open and lead is closed information to the non-lead jammer referee. So what I mean is this. Beginning of the jam, we have no lead jammer. So, you know, if the... Uh, as one referee gets lead, you know, tweet, tweet, 
the other referee should, in theory, know, ah, well, then lead is no longer available. In fact, it doesn't always work that way. They're often very busy, uh, very occupied. They're jammers sometimes, or, or sometimes they're just jammers stuck in the pack for a minute and a half or something, and the other jammer got out but then fell back and they got stuck. To, it just it happens sometimes. You get confused, and the, the jam referee doesn't know, is the lead open or is it closed? Is it available or is it not? So as the front IPR, being able to... Uh, first off, when lead closes, when, you know, tweet, tweet, immediately yelling, you know, lead is closed, black has lead, or, you know, lead is closed, red has lead. That's a very helpful piece of information. If the jammer, you know, gets out but doesn't get lead because, they would say, there was a no earned pass or something like that, when they're out, you know, yelling, lead is open, you know, uh, again, just yelling that to let them know that even though the other jammer's not in the pack anymore, lead is still open. If it takes you know, more than a couple moments for the non-lead jammer and the, uh, to get, you know, to, like, the front of the pack, then it doesn't hurt to, you know, when the, or when near the front of the engagement, it doesn't hurt to eventually um, remind the referee, lead is open or lead is closed. Just give them a reminder. The more time that's elapsed, the more useful a reminder is. Now, in theory, these are not required duties of the front IPR, and you will meet referees that will say, no, the front IPR should never have to do this. The onus is on the jammer referee to get it right. That is true. However, the accuracy of getting it right will go up if the front IPR is able to provide assistance in the matter. So one of the problems with the front IPR now is remembering a minute and a half into the jam, did lead ever get called or did the person get a penalty? Or you know, you just It's just hard to come up with an instant replay. So one of the things I like to do as jammer referee is I cross like my fingers or I cross the, you know, like I, I cross a couple of fingers at the beginning of the jam and I've got them down by my side and I keep them crossed until lead is, lead is called. If the person gets out and doesn't get lead, then I still keep them crossed because then I know even a minute into the jam, if my fingers are crossed, lead is still open. That's just my little thing. Other referees have their own little techniques. Figure out what works for you. What's important ultimately is that we are getting uh, lead declared properly and we are getting the not lead jammer to correctly understand they are not, you know, uh, lead jammer. We, essentially, we're declaring lead properly, and we are declaring, so to speak, not lead properly as well. How much communication you do, how you remind yourself, how you specifically do that communication is really up to you. But jammer referees will generally appreciate it if you can make that communication available. Now, if appropriate, it's also useful to offer a fast assessment about who should have lead jammer status. One of the issues that happens sometimes is both jammers get out of the pack at the same time, and they just they both pass the foremost blocker. Or maybe they're, uh, you know, they're they're kind of neck and neck, and the foremost blocker falls down. So they instantly, both of them have now completed the requirements for being lead at the same time. Who gets lead in this case? The foremost jammer does. But what happens if they're neck and neck? You know, like which one gets it? Well, that's where the front IPR can offer their own assessment, you know, based on their angle. And sometimes they don't know and they're not going to say anything. But other times they might, you know, from their angle, because remember, the jammer referees are looking at their own jammer. Sometimes they're not even aware that the other jammer is even like right there. But to instantly be able to say yellow was first or black was first or something, that can help them, you know, that, that can provide a bit of useful information for them on making their assessment, uh, you know, about whether they should award lead to their jammer or not. Um, you are not, if you say yellow was first, you are not saying absolutely yellow was first and I have declared it. Like I have called lead for yellow. It is not your place to call lead. It is up to that yellow jammer referee or the jammer referee for, the, for say the black jammer. You are just simply providing your bit of insight on who you think has earned lead, but it's not up to you to call it and the jammer referees will have to sort it out between themselves. By the way, if you don't say anything, what eventually will happen is one jammer gets in front of the other, and that that one is the one that's declared lead. But if you think you can be of assistance, certainly offer that bit of information. Finally, if necessary, chase down the pivot following an incomplete or illegal star pass. Now, we're going to go uh, into more of this in star passes, and I don't want to bog down too much here, but because <laughs> we're getting into one of these cascading series of errors that I hate. So, uh, you know... What happens sometimes is the, say there's an illegal star pass. The jammer uh, steps out of bounds. You know, they're only two inches out of bounds, so they think they're in bounds, but they, 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 they're out of bounds, and they hand the, uh, the star to the pivot. Pivot is like, got it! You know, they now think they're the jammer, and 
even if the jam referee is cor correctly assessing a star pass violation penalty and sending that jammer off to the penalty box, the pivot thinks they're the jammer. And now they've got the, you know, the star, and they're racing forward out of the engagement zone, and they're throwing it on their head, and they're starting to tear around the track. Well, jammer referee is not going to go chase them. That jammer referee has to stay on the jammer. An OPR is not going to be able to chase them down very well, because remember, that pivot is now going as fast as they can. They're going to be trying to sprint around the pack, and an OPR is just simply not going to be able to catch them. They're on the outside. This is where the front IPR has to step in now. So the front IPR in that case can base, uh, you know, chase after the jammer. They, they, <laughs> giving the rear IPR a little heads up that they're in charge of the pack is always handy. So if you yell quick, you've got the pack, you know, that's, that's nice if you could say that. Sometimes you don't have time and you basically just immediately turn, you know, skate across the apex or skate back a little bit. And you're now telling the pivot, you know, like that, like, you know, blue two, three, you are not the jammer or blue two, three, you are a pivot out of play. And again, as we'll talk in later lessons, if that pivot kind of keeps going, keeps insisting their jammer, they can eventually get a penalty for this. But by, by being right on top of it and going there and heading off this problem, you're going, you know, you're preventing this cascading series of errors. Because if you don't, that pivot is going to skate all around, they're going to come back in the pack, and they're going to start going through the pack, wearing the jammer cap, and now the opposing team is, is this the jammer? But I thought that was the jammer there that got the penalty going to the box, and I thought they're serving as jammer. And their own team is going to be confused, and the referees are going to be confused, and now, <laughs> now we got problems. So head that one out. And by the way, even worse would be if the jammer referee decided to abandon their own jammer and go track down that pivot, and now they come back and suddenly, if, especially if they hadn't gotten their jammer to the box yet, uh, now they're suddenly like, uh-oh, my jammer's not wearing the star anymore. Which one was my jammer? And that's a really, really, really awful mistake to make, too. So, anyway, front IPR chases down the pivot following certain incomplete and illegal star passes. As I say, certain. Sometimes it's not necessary, but when necessary, do it. Finally, a few tips here on IPRs. First, the front IPR should remain ahead or even with the foremost blocker. If you're trying to watch the front of the, you know, the foremost skaters, if you're, if a skater is getting behind you, you can't see them anymore. So not at least if you're skating backwards, which is exactly what the front IPR spends the bulk of the game doing. So don't let one get ahead of you. I mean, sometimes it's going to happen. They're just going to sprint, you know, uh, uh, skaters can be very, very fast when they put their mind to it. But uh, when they do, that forces you to turn to keep the person in your line of sight, and now you're not seeing the pack very well. So don't let that person get ahead of you. Stay ahead of them or even. Second, as I said, the, fr the front IPR primarily skates backwards. Good backwards skating skills are important. You're going to constantly want to work on this. You don't have to be an expert backwards speed skater by any means. You know, maybe if you want to work at the champs level, that would be really handy. But you certainly want to have competent backwards skating skills, and you should practice this and work on it so you're able to do the position when the time comes for you to learn it. Third, for both IPRs, they want to skate at least a few feet away from the track line. They do this for two reasons. First, it gives the jammer referees room to pass. Those jammer re referees have to keep their eyes on the jammer. And if the front uh, front IPR, or if, if the IPRs are getting too close to the line, now the jammer referee has to go in back of the uh, the IPRs, and now their view of their own jammer is being blocked, and that's going to prevent, uh, or that's going to cause errors in penalty calling, scoring, etc. So the IPRs get back, let the jammer referees go in front of you, and also. Those jammer referees, uh, so, some IPRs have the habit of crowding the line. They just they can't resist getting forward. Uh, I know a couple referees in particular that really like to do this. Just get back. Just keep getting back. If you're if you are having to tell your remind your jam referees, hey, you need to get closer to the line. You need to get closer to the line. There's a chance that you're in their way, and you need to take that extra step back. So. Judge for yourself where you tend to be mid-jam and watch video of yourself because oftentimes during a jam, you're not aware that you're positioning. You started in good shape, but then you got closer to the line. So watching video of you will allow you to see where you actually are during a jam. Also, getting back from the line widens your field of vision. We talked about in the other lesson that if a skater is standing right next to you and you're looking at their feet, you can't see their head. Well, you can probably see their waist because they're right next to you, but you're not really going to see their forearms. If you get four or five feet back from the line, 
now you're going to, and you look at their feet, now you're going to have a much wider perspective. Also, if you get low, uh, you'll notice sometimes jam referees will, will like, cry. it's hard for me to do this in my chair, but they basically get low, uh, and, or I'm sorry, IPRs will get low sometimes, because again, that widens their perspective, because now they can look at their feet, and they can actually have a lot more of that skater in their view. So getting back from the line, getting low, and just generally widening your field of vision, what you're looking at. And one final tip. If you notice that a jammer referee is inconsistent about dropping the whistle from their mouth when they're covering the not lead jammer, add their name to the lead is closed call to subtly and politely call their attention to your declaration. For example, lead is closed, Steve. Let me explain. In roller derby, you the jam referees really don't want to call the jam off by accident. It happens sometimes that the not lead jammer starts tapping. They get confused. They think they're lead. They cap it. If you got the whistle in your mouth, sometimes just out of instinct, you just instantly call off the jam. They're like, ah, oh, crap, I should, wasn't supposed to do that. And that's actually a penalty to the jammer. And it was a penalty, even though there was officiating error, it's still a penalty. So what they do is they spit out their whistle if you're on the not lead jammer. That way, you you know, you have to reach for your finger whistle, and it gives you that extra second to think, oh, maybe I shouldn't actually call it over there. It helps remind you. But uh, some referees are inconsistent about spitting that whistle out of their mouth. They really don't. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Now, mind you, there are some referees that they don't, they don't ever spit it out. They just train themselves to get it right, and they always have a whistle in their mouth, and that's entirely fine if that's what they want to do. But if you notice the jam referees do like to kind of spit it out, but they're being inconsistent and they're forgetting, this could be indication that they're either not hearing you, maybe your volume's not loud enough when you, when you say lead is closed, or maybe they're just so focused on the game they're not processing it. In that particular case, just adding their name. Lead is closed, Steve. Over there, will just that very subtly, and they won't even be aware you're doing it. Just calls their attention to your declaration that lead is closed and might prompt them to spit out the whistle. So, a little subtle tip that, that I've noticed over the years. That concludes lesson, uh, lesson 9 on Inside Pack Referees. We'll be back in Lesson 10 to talk about Jammer Referees. Thanks.